I talk about Jehovah's Witnesses a good bit, and sometimes I make reference to the anointed. What are the anointed? How many people are going to heaven? What's the deal with the 144,000 number they give? How do you become anointed? What's the process like, and can anybody do it? Let's talk about what they are and how you become one. Also, if you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me on Patreon or by checking out my merchandise on Teespring. YouTube is up and down constantly, and it's pretty stressful worrying about what they're going to do next, so consider supporting me there. Okay, let's get into it. So what are the anointed? Basically, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that 144,000 people are going to heaven to serve as kings and priests along with Jesus after Armageddon. Everybody else is going to stay here on planet Earth to live in a Garden of Eden-like paradise. They're part of the quote-unquote great crowd. But those 144,000 people will basically be raptured to heaven as soon as Armageddon starts. Their responsibility will be to destroy everybody who isn't an active, believing Jehovah's Witness. That includes the ones who are still baptized but are kind of having doubts. The ones who aren't 100% sure. Or the ones who committed a sin but haven't revealed it to the elders. And after they've done the job and everybody is taken care of, it'll be the responsibility of the remaining Jehovah's Witnesses to bury the bodies of all 8 billion people on earth and rebuild. In fact, that was taught to to us from a young age. You're not supposed to go to school for philosophy or law or animation. I mean, the occasional person does, but it's heavily discouraged. You're supposed to go to school to be a tradesman. They told me, we don't need doctors in the new system because nobody will ever get sick. Don't become a doctor. Don't become an animator. Don't do art. Don't do philosophy. Nobody cares. Learn carpentry. Learn plumbing. Learn electrical. When the new system comes, we'll need to repopulate and rebuild all the empty buildings. That should give you an idea of the mindset they foster. So how do you earn a spot as one of the anointed, as one of the 144,000? Is it earned? No, it's not earned. It's something you just know. For a while, they thought that Armageddon would come when the number finally maxed out at 144,000, so they were accepting basically everybody who claimed it. Every year, they do something they call the memorial. It's basically their version of communion, except it's once a year, and only the anointed eat the bread and drink the wine. They pass the bread and wine around to everybody, so everybody in the congregation is supposed to touch the plate and the cup, but only the anointed eat it. Only the 144,000. Since there are 8.5 million Jehovah's Witnesses, you can imagine seeing an anointed person eat the bread and drink the wine is pretty rare. They don't really publicize the number, but I'd have to guess it's probably around 130,000 by now. It includes some of Jesus' disciples and some others from around that time. Maybe Paul. Anyways, I've seen somebody eat the bread and drink the wine one time. Dude's name was Maurice. Really nice guy. He ate it for the very first time when I was sitting there. Everybody was surprised and happy and all that. We felt honored to be in the presence of one of God's chosen people. Jehovah's Witnesses theology is set up in such a way that the anointed are technically the only true Christians, and the other 8.4 million are just hangers-on. They only make it through Armageddon through the grace of the anointed, basically. So why 144,000? Why are there only 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses going to heaven and not everybody? The answer comes from Revelation chapter 14 and chapter 7. Chapter 14 says, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his and his father's name written on their foreheads. Then in Revelation 7 it says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or the sea or any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given the power to harm the land and sea. Do not harm the land or sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Then it goes on to say 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Now Israel was split up into tribes. That's kind of how it worked. Different groups handled different things. For example, the tribe of Levi handled the money. They were like the treasurers back then. But Jehovah's Witnesses claim that they know this 
can apply to Gentiles, not just people who were directly from the Israeli line, because there's dispute about whether or not the name Judah was from that tribe, or if it was from the territory that it occupied. But either way, right after that it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. So they say that anointed Jehovah's Witnesses are Gentiles from the figurative tribes of Israel, not direct descendants. And every other baptized Jehovah's Witness is part of the great crowd. So theologically, if you were comparing it to, say, Catholicism, who believe that everybody who believes and confesses and whatnots goes to heaven, the 144,000 anointed Jehovah's Witnesses would be the only true Christians, and all other dedicated, baptized, believing, active Jehovah's Witnesses are part of that great crowd. Kind of interesting. I find it particularly interesting that the verse that references the great crowd says, Before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. To me, that implies that the 144,000 are not from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They're from a very specific nation, Israel. But whatever. Either way, it's interesting. It just seems like a massive hole in Jehovah's Witnesses theology. So that's who the anointed are. Now, I've explained this next part before, but it's kind of confusing without that extra context. So let me explain the second generation teaching. It's basically Jehovah's Witnesses active end of the world prediction. They're renowned for making end times prediction after end times prediction. And I even made a video about all of their failed predictions recently. So give it a look if you want to hear the entire list from beginning to end. But this active one is called the second generation teaching, and it leans heavily heavily on the anointed, on the 144,000. As most people know, the year 1914 is pretty significant to Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe that Jesus came back invisibly in 1914, where most Christians believe that Jesus will be coming back at some undetermined time in the future, and that'll mark the rapture and the start of Armageddon. With Jehovah's Witnesses, 1914 started as an end times prediction, and when nobody got raptured or anything, the founder had to modify it. The story goes, he walked into a room and said something like, the Gentile times are here, and everybody clapped. So they believe that we're in the time of the end. And the next step in the process is the Great Tribulation, which is where Jehovah's Witnesses will be hunted by world governments. They'll all turn on Jehovah's Witnesses and jail them, which is why it's so significant that Russia banned them recently. They think it's a sign of the end times. It's fueling their persecution complex, which is where you get pictures like this one, Russian Jehovah's Witnesses smiling while they're escorted off to jail. From my understanding, the Russian government even tortured some of them, which honestly is really sad to me. It's heartbreaking, in fact. Jehovah's Witnesses don't have empathy for people like me, apostates, but I can still have empathy for them. I can still feel for them. I can still wish that no harm come to them, contrary to their position on things. I think the majority of Jehovah's Witnesses are genuinely good, honest, nice people who want to help. The problem is that they're horrifically misguided about how they should be helping. They've been fed full of BS about how they should treat and interact with outsiders. One more thing about the Great Tribulation. They believe that when it starts, the numbers are permanently locked in. Nobody else will be able to join. And they've been saying this a lot in their literature and propaganda videos. When the Great Tribulation starts, their message will change from good news to judgment. So instead of knocking on your door and giving a flowery message about how they want you to join, they'll just continue coming to people's doors and telling them that they're are all going to die. Full stop. I seriously wonder if they're ever going to conclude that the end is here and change the message from good news to judgment. Wouldn't it be a sick irony if they motivated governments to ban them by doing something like that? Basically triggering the hunt that they're expecting by their course of actions. Anyways, as I was saying, they claim that within the generation of 1914, the Great Tribulation will start, which means they'll be hunted down, and then Armageddon will start, which is when the 144,000 anointed people will be raptured to heaven. But of course, it didn't happen. Happen. Nothing happened. The world kept on trucking, so they started calculating deadlines. When is the absolute last moment that Armageddon could possibly come and still fit in with their theology? Well, they say that the generation they're talking about starts from the moment the very last person got anointed before 1914. So they picked out the one they knew of, which was Fred Franz in 1913. That's just the example they use. There are probably others who got anointed just after him. But for the sake of example, they always cite him. That means Armageddon has to come before he dies, right? Well, he died in 1992. Now what? Their theology fell flat. 
How do they account for that? Through something called the second generation teaching. They claim that anybody who was anointed while the last person anointed before 1914 is part of his same generation. So they're redefining generation to mean contemporary. Very different things. Anyways, I did the math on it to see what the deadline is for the new prediction. I think the youngest person to ever be appointed to the governing body or to ever be anointed was 27 when he was anointed. That could be inaccurate, so let's just be super generous. Let's take a nice round number and say the dude was 25 when he was anointed and appointed to the governing body. And it had to be before Fred Franz died in 1992. Hell, let's make it super extra generous and say 93, assuming there was somebody anointed just after Fred Franz and just before before 1914. And the average age of an American male is 78.69 years. We'll be even more generous and say it's 80 years to have a nice round number again. Doing the math, that means that they have an absolute max of 29 years before they have to come to a decision about their active end times prediction, the second generation teaching. That's being way more overly generous than I need to be. Realistically, they only have like 15 more years before people start asking tough questions. At that point, they basically have two choices. One, they can switch their message from good news to judgment, thus triggering the attack they believe is coming anyways. Or two, they can modify the numbers and teaching again and claim they got it wrong the first time. They do that kind of thing all the time, honestly. They call it new light. Every time they modify some teaching or belief, they just say that Jehovah revealed new information to them. But the problem with that last option is the fact that their entire theology is built on this teaching. If this is wrong, then the 1914 teaching is wrong. All kinds of other stuff. Almost everything that sets this religion apart from traditional Protestant Christianity doctrinally depends on this end times prediction being correct, which is why they didn't just do away with the teaching that the end will come within the generation that was alive and anointed during 1914. They had to extend it instead. I can't see how they're going to extend it again. They had this whole belief about how the end was coming in 1975 because they calculated it out and found that it was going to be the end of 6,000 years since creation. And being the Bible numerology aficionados that they are, and believing that God read from the end of day six to the end of day seven, they thought the end of the 6,000th year was going to mark the start of Armageddon. So they stopped saying the end is near in their literature, which they've been saying since the inception of the religion, and they started saying the end is here. They even had a catchphrase, stay alive to 75. They gave public talks about it. They said, if you're on your deathbed, just make it one more day, one more week, one more month. Just make it to 1975. Well, now, as Jehovah's Witnesses, as runners, even though some of us have become a little weary, it almost seems as though Jehovah has provided meat in due season because he's held up before all of us a new goal, a new year, something to reach out for, and it just seems it's given all of us so much more energy and power in this final burst of speed for the finish line. And that's the year 1975. As one brother put it, stay alive to 75. And guess what happened when 1975 rolled around? Nothing, of course. They hemorrhaged people. It was such a serious blunder that they had to address it directly. They said that some people, quote unquote, in the organization foolishly, quote unquote, made predictions. And when they started losing people, they tried to cover it up by quoting a Bible verse that says something like, in the end times, the greater number will cool off. I.e., the fact that they were losing people means that the end is that much closer. So I expect something like that to happen. I don't think they have the stomach to tell their people to start delivering the judgment message in instead of the good news message. That being said, they're perfectly set up to be in a position to have their membership take a pill if they gave the order, or to drink a cocktail if it came down to it. I'm 100% sure that a massive number of Jehovah's Witnesses would do it if ordered by the governing body, just like the Heaven's Gate cult did. I just hope I can bring as many people out as possible before it becomes an issue. Anyways, that's all I've got for you. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, then consider supporting me on Patreon. YouTube is up and down and it's seriously stresses me out sometimes. May was a terrible month. June was so-so. July is another terrible month. So if you want to make sure I can continue doing what I do and not have to worry about appeasing YouTube with the content I make, then you can support me on Patreon or you can support me on Teespring. And one more thing I wanted to mention. I've been hosting websites for a really long time. It's kind of what I did before I started YouTube. It's not for everybody. I just manage a Linux VPS cluster with some websites on it, like my own website, telltaleatheist.com or faithlessforum.com. The servers are just 
just sitting there not doing much. So if anybody has a website they want to host, you can contact me about it through my business email address, which is in the description. The servers have cPanel, so if you're unfamiliar with that, or if you're unfamiliar with SSH, FTP, or Shell, it might not be for you. I typically run WordPress websites, and it's mostly just hosting space. Not much support beyond me making sure it's free of viruses and hackers. Something to consider. Also, don't forget to check out my podcast where I talk about all kinds of interesting subjects, like religious and cult news. I talked about Jehovah's Witnesses just the other day. All links are in the description, as always. Okay, thanks for watching, guys.